Welcome to Demand Gen Visionaries, presented by Qualified. Go to qualified.com to learn more. I'm Ian Faison, CEO of Caspian Studios, and today I am joined by recurring guest, Kevin, how are you? I'm good. It's good to be back. Recurring guest. Thank you. It feels good. You're not super new into your role at Clearbit, but it was at the more of the beginning of your journey. And here we are checking in a year later. I'd been there maybe five months and now it's been almost two years. So yeah, different times. Yeah. So tell us what is going on with Clearbit? How have things changed in the past year for you and y'all? Things have gotten busy. It is a, a little bit different landscape today than it was in, in December 21. And we're certainly working with a lot more companies who are a lot more focused on the quality of their funnel and of their go-to-market motion. I think one of the big things that we've seen is if you go back to in the Wayback Machine to 21, there was a sense of just, yeah, give me whatever I, I need to grow as quickly as possible, sort of a growth at all costs mindset, because it felt like all boats were rising so quickly in B2B. And what we see today is more of a how do I grow efficiently? My demand gen budget probably isn't going up and my uh, focus on my ideal customers needs to get even stronger. So the customers that we're talking to today, various states and various sizes, but there's a commonality in how do I be efficient? How do I make sure that I have the best understanding of my go-to-market and put data to work in the best way I can? So that's a lot of what we're thinking about these days. And for our listeners that don't know, can you just give a quick refresh on Clearbit and who your customers are and, and who you serve? Yeah. So I'm Kevin Tate, CMO at Clearbit. And Clearbit brings data. We have 50 million company profiles and hundreds of millions of contact profiles that are all about pretty much every company with a website. And companies use that and all of our APIs and our platform to put that data to work all across their go-to-market. So they'll use it to do everything from target their ads more precisely to know who's coming to their website because we can resolve the IP address, which is a big one. And once you know what company someone is from on your website, you can do all kinds of cool stuff. You can personalize the website. You can pop the chat window because you know they're a great prospect. And then you can do things like follow up with them afterwards because you know who the key buyers are based on the the data you have access to. So companies use Clearbit to make their whole go-to-market smarter. And obviously you mentioned this, but we have this new normal of, we have so many new normals these days. So many new uh, normals. But the new normal <laughs> yeah, of everybody getting their pipeline scrutinized more than ever. What are you seeing from your customers and how they are able to navigate those conversations? It's a good question. And it's fun. Clearbit's a fun vantage point because you can put this data to work in so many different places that working with our customers, we get a litmus test or a reflection of where they focused. And where they're focused today is largely around optimizing their inbound or said differently, how do I get more better leads from my website? Which is interesting, certainly related to demand gen and how do I spend effectively? I think a lot of what we're seeing is, yeah, I'm going to get them to the site and that's going to cost me a lot of money. How do I make sure that I give them the very best site experience, that I know who they are, and that I'm optimizing my sales efforts around the highest priority ones? So a lot of that rhymes with, with optimizing that inbound motion, and that's become a real big focus area in this new economy. What about the outbound motion as well? Because this is something that with budgets constricting, and people are a little bit more concerned with how they're spending money. I don't know if you've noticed this, but I've noticed that like LinkedIn, for example, is cheaper now mm -hmm. for us, yep. for sure. in the LinkedIn ads that Caspian is running. Mm -hmm. So I think that there's been a pullback on that stuff. I have absolutely no, <laughs> it's completely anecdotal. And I'm sure it's not everyone who has a data company is probably like, that. definitely not true for us. But yeah, I don't know. what. But what are you seeing in terms of, of outbound and creating demand? rather than the capturing size. Yeah. So a few pieces there and some of the ones that we end up working with customers on most. So first is the um, using social, including LinkedIn, to target really precisely with B2B attributes, right? So making sure you're going after the companies and the industries and the subsectors and the titles and the departments. All that is, is a lot of what Clearbit gets used for on the demand gen side. We're also seeing the economics change there. And I think some of that is the platforms growing up and getting better with data like ours to target more specifically. 
I do think also the reality is, given the market shift, there's more tire kicking than there used to be. It's a little bit of an overcharacterization, but when things were really frothy, you could be more sure that someone who came across your content ad on Facebook or Instagram or somewhere, yeah, they might just be in the market. And now I think it's less likely that they're ready to buy now, but it's just as important for you as a brand to be building awareness so that you're top of mind when the time is right. So it just kind of changes that equation a little bit. I know, you know, for Clearbit, for example, we've changed the way we look at our social advertising, expecting less direct leads and more awareness and engagement that then lead people to our site that then will turn into leads when the time is right. So I think it's changed a bit the way people expect things from their demand spend. But then the other side of that, when you you think about outbound, there's that spend and demand creation. There's also the sales outbounding. And you have a BDR team or an SDR team that is trying to start net new conversations. And that's an area where we see companies kind of almost bifurcating. So we see some teams really saying, all right, get on the phones. We just, we got a, we got a cold call. And I know everybody hates cold calling, but we got to do it. And it's not wrong, but I know my phone is just blown up and it feels like everybody has my mobile number. And so- Yeah, it's awful. It's it's awful. And so that's not, (laughs) it won't shock you to hear, that's not our approach. We're not so much focused on, on that and enabling that motion. Where we've been working on, and we launched something last year called Capture that does this, when a company is showing interest, because you can tell from who came to your website, how do you make sure you can connect with the key buyers at that company, whether that's through campaigns or through emails? Like, how do you start building that air cover awareness at the right time? And that's the sales outbound motion that we've been more working with companies to enable And again, this capability around capture to get the key contacts for the companies that are showing intent and appear to be in market, that's been a pretty powerful tool. So I think it adds up to sort of smarter outbound. I like that, smarter outbound. I think everybody thinks that second half budgets are going to be a little different than they are now. Mm -hmm. And gosh, isn't that just like, I was having this conversation with our CFO and I was thinking about how hard projecting is right now. And thinking about the second half of the year and all these conversations that people are kicking the can, people do that anyways in the normal sales cycle, right? Yeah. But thinking of it strategically of like how many people are doing that, and a lot of that will end up being kick the can till Q4 or Q1 of next year. Ultimately, a lot of the advice is do more with less, sit back a little bit, don't waste your money, getting in conversations that aren't going to convert. And I almost feel the opposite as I almost feel like getting in those conversations now and really helping your sales team to build thoughtful, relevant sort of experiences for those people to know that like, we're not the pain in the ass to work with. We're not going to be beating down your door every two seconds to close the deal. We're actually going to like understand what you're saying. And we're actually building content and community resources and things that are anticipating you're wanting to get budget back and do these initiatives that you want to do later in the year. I don't know. That's just kind of how I personally feel about it. Yeah. Uh, and it's how I feel as a buyer. Maybe that's why it's because yeah. that's how I feel as a buyer where it's like, I kind of want to know when I'm going to get to make those decisions and the CFO isn't telling me. So I, if you can help me as a seller to like crisis plan a little bit for me, that would be nice. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. What do you think? I think you're right. And it's, it's a great point because people take very different approaches under that stress, right? So what I picture when you talked about, let's say you've got now 50 people, 50 companies in your pipeline, and now you know that they're going to be kicking the can down on budget. One approach is, well, just focus on the five that you know have budget and can buy. Okay. Yep. That's that's not wrong. But then there's also, all right, let's make that 50, 100 because I, I don't know quite when, but I want to be in as many conversations as I can when the time is right. And you got to do both. Right. And I think that's some of the sales versus marketing tension right now is how you focus on closing the highest priority, but you're also building pipe for the future. One of the things that we've done as a part of that strategy, to your point, is we've focused more on our free tools. So we offer Mm -hmm. something called the weekly visitor report that lets you see who's coming to your website for free and 
And it doesn't show you all the companies because it's the free version, but you can unlock more. And then we've got things like our TAM calculator and our Connect extension for Chrome. We've been really relying on those to let companies who maybe are kicking the can down the road in terms of budget, but start using Clearbit and start seeing the value and start trying it out. And we trust that when the time is right, we'll be top of mind. So that's been part of our kind of not so secret plan to expand that set of conversations, even though we know that it might be a while before they're ready to buy. I absolutely love that advice because it speaks to the person who really wants to solve this problem right now, but doesn't have the budget for it. So it's Mm -hmm. like, just give them a taste of solving it now, Mm -hmm. at least so that they could start solving it now. And like most software products, pricing is endlessly complex thing. And I don't pretend to know a lot about it because it is so complex. If there is something that you can do to work on right now to get people into the product now is a six month free trial. Hey, you really think that this is going to close in six months? Okay, here's your six month free trial. And let's see how much we can onboard you and get you using the product or whatever, because we know you're going to be back. Mm -hmm. Maybe you don't do that for anyone, but maybe there's like a super high LTV profile of your persona that if you're like, hey, everyone in fintech, we're going to give a six month free trial for whatever, however you think about that stuff, and then launch a campaign like that. And maybe that's totally wrong. Maybe nobody would care. And maybe that loses you a bunch of business down the road because they don't have enough skin in the game or something like that. But I think it's an interesting thing to focus on those free tools and getting people into the product when they don't have the money to really experience the whole thing. I think you're right. I think you're right. And I think we may look back at this time and realize, oh, there was a whole land grab going on with free tools and free trials. And if you weren't participating, then you're, you're starting from the back foot. So that's certainly what we've been leaning into. And as a marketer, it also means a lot more companies that you're working with and talking to and learning from and are getting value from these tools. It just expands the conversation versus that sort of former approach, which is just like, all right, let's get really, you know, narrow minded or tunnel vision around just the people with budget. It's a hard way to live. So yeah, we've been expanding. Let's get into our next segment the playbook, where you open up the playbook and talk about the tactics that help you win. You play to win the game. Hello? You play to win the game. You don't play to just play it. Obviously, the first time around, you told us your uncuttable budget items, but I'm curious how those things have changed. What are your three uncuttable budget items now as we currently sit as the entire world changes every six months? Yeah. Yeah. What are your three uncuttables? Three uncuttables. So the first would be mid-funnel content. And this is a little different from what I would have said 15 months ago. In this world of people who may have interest but not budget and trying to make sure we can nurture people along through what may be a longer cycle, we've really leaned into what we define as mid-funnel content. So we actually organized our team into top of funnel, mid-funnel, bottom of funnel. And each has its own objectives and content and things. And I realize we're not the first ones to do that. But the mid-funnel focus for us are things like guides. So how-to guides. If you're trying to better score and route your leads using Clearbit and Lead Feeder, here's exactly how to do that step by step. And we've been, I think we published 12 of those guides in just the last few weeks. So that's been a big focus for us around this mid funnel content that helps someone solve very specific problems using Clearbit, but also gives us that signal okay, someone's moving from kind of looking around and learning to They're reading guides about very specific implementation and how to approach things. That tells us that they're getting further down the path. So that's uncuttable number one. I think uncuttable number two has been our use of our own reveal capability. That's the ability that lets you turn an IP address into knowing what company someone someone is from so you can treat them like you know them because you do. And we actually weren't taking as much advantage of that in the past as we have been in the last year. So we use one of our partners, Mutiny, on our site to do personalization based on that IP address. We use partners like Chili Piper to make sure that we're scheduling meetings right away with the ones that are best fit. And we have a lot of scoring that now goes in the prioritization for the salespeople based on what we could reveal about that company 
and how well they fit our ICP. So applying a lot of the sort of, I don't know, clear bit capabilities to clear bit has been a focus of ours over the last year or so. And I would say that we've seen really strong results from being able to know who our ICPs are and then treat them like VIPs. And so that has become an indispensable budget item for us. And then I have a new one. We'll see. If I'm back on here in a year, we can see whether or not this one comes true or not. But we're trying to start something new, again, focused on mid-funnel, which is a weekly demo, a clear bit live weekly demo, where we just say, look, we're going to be here every week. One of our SEs is going to show the platform and, and what you can do with it for 20 minutes. And if you want to come, do and ask questions and really low pressure, really low hurdle. I have this theory that any buyers, but especially smart, experienced, technical marketing buyers, like, hey, let's schedule some time for you to get on the phone with a salesperson. That's kind of a high hurdle. That's asking a lot of my time. And I would like to put a lower hurdle in the middle of our funnel that's just like, we're here every Wednesday. Feel free to join. So I, we're hoping to kick that off here in a couple of weeks. And I think it could be a really interesting waypost in our mid funnel. Let's just see who comes. I don't know. I don't know if five are going to come or 50 are going to come, but it's good either way. And it gives us a way to just, again, just engage in this real live way with our mid funnel customers in a way that's low pressure. I love it. I've heard that has worked really well for other companies. Somebody did a post on that. Maybe it was Jason Lemkin did a post where he was like, every single company should do this. It's such a no brainer. I forget. Maybe I think it was him. Yeah, I agree. I, mean, I totally why agree. Not? Yeah. That's the thing. If one person shows up, that's what a regular demo is. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. And it's interesting as we've been working on this kind of side benefit, which is that our AEs and our solution engineers always need more practice and demo. So having them rotate through could be a really nice way to also give them more practice and hone those skills. So I think only goodness can come of it. But again, if we're back here in a year, you, you can test me. It's fascinating. I'm going to be really interested to see the results. So I'm excited to follow along. Are you also going to publish a recorded demo that people can just consume on their own? We've asked ourselves that question. My guess is yes, because why not? But my only hesitance, hesitancy is that I wouldn't want it to supplant to the other. So this, we do want something that's low hurdle. There's still a little bit of a like, yeah, I'm going to go to the Wednesday Clearbit Live versus I'm just going to speed through the recorded ones. So I don't know. Probably is the answer, but maybe we'll take it and cut it up into three or four short subjects that really become more like a quick take on certain parts of the solution and, and use it that way. I was reading a great sales post where they were talking about the... It's like the four questions that every salesperson would ask. Gosh, I got to find this thing now. But they were all very listener heavy, right? They're intended for that really brilliant sales rep that wants to go listen to how these people describe their own problems in like a creative way and pull those things out and map that back to how the product fits in there, which is what every single marketer wants to hear that their salespeople are doing. Yeah. And I wonder how you can create a really easy next step to that demo experience to get there? Or if it's just a totally different type of buyer that needs that thing? Because I always look at it as like the type of buyer self-selects into the way that they want. But at some point in time, there's going to need to be some hand-holding. And if you let them self-select into the when the hand... Like I've done this a million times. Like, yeah, yeah, okay, I got it. And then it's like, you get to the point and you're like, wait, no, actually, I do have like 10 questions. And it's like, these were all the right. things that you said you got, you know? Totally. So like, there is that natural thing there. But I wonder how there's that sort of personalized touch. I also always wonder if the next step is talking to a person with that role rather than a salesperson. Like if you put an A, B, like button A, talk to a salesperson, button B, talk to your peer at our company who does your same job. Right. Like how many people would click the button B? Oh my gosh. I know in Clearbit's case, it would be a lot. And it's not because we, we don't have great salespeople. We do. But the so often we're talking to a demand marketer that is looking to, they're looking for demand gen strategies and how to optimize their inbound, say, and they want to talk to Colin who runs demand on my team. And because and it's great and we get them together and they're da, 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 because they're living in the same world with the same challenges. And it's one of the fun things about Clearbit because 
it gets very meta, right? We're using Clearbit at Clearbit to sell Clearbit. Yeah. And so we have a lot to talk about when it comes to how do you actually use this well. So it keeps it fun. I think it's also interesting to see how the, what you described, that sort of solution architecture, and let's get on the whiteboard and figure out how is actually all this going to fit for you in your particular context. That has changed in this virtual Zoom-based world. I'm dating myself here, but when I started my career, and it was in the late 90s, I was literally filling up actual whiteboards with here's how your website's going to work and everything. Yeah. And that it's a little trickier to do over Zoom. And this is how we all sell today. We see people doing some pretty innovative things. I'm hopeful that that sort of co-creation of the solution in a whiteboardy kind of way is something that we get better and better at in these virtual environments. Cause I think it's such an important part of the consultative selling process. Yeah. Agreed. And I think that ultimately if you're doing, if you have that strong consultant level sales approach that at the end of the day, yes, the sales engineer is part of that, but there has to be someone who actually has this job because right. at the end of the right. day, like the reason why consultants make a lot of money is because they tell you how to, what's the old phrase, uh, ask you for the time and tell you to buy a better watch or something or whatever. The yeah, they borrow your watch happen. and then tell you the time. Yeah, exactly. That's right. Yeah, right, Thank you. right, right, right. <laughs> oh, so true. I butchered yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but the alternative to that is the person who is sitting in the seat with you. And I wonder if the pathway is there if we eliminated the pathways, the roadblocks in order to talk to someone like that faster, because they got to find that person at your company, they got to schedule time with them, they, yeah. they use a tool like Calendly or Chili Pepper or whatever, you know, yeah, it's like, yeah, yeah. It, you get into so many different things. I wonder also if the demo that you record, if you made a recorded one available, that was an interactive one where it is like your person sitting in the seat, like calling for you where he's asking questions or they're asking him questions about his product. So it's not just a straight demo. It gets a lot of those, like the consultative questions asked. Mm -hmm. They're like, oh, well, actually I have this problem mm -hmm. and this wherever. I don't know if you could act that or if you could just have him do it honestly, but. That's an interesting angle. I'm going to take it in a weird direction, which is that it reminds me that sort of, how do I accomplish this question? And then how do you get back answers to that at scale? The whole AI chat GPT thing right now. I, mean, I feel like so yeah. much of what, I mean, we've seen all the demos this week, even just from HubSpot and Salesforce and companies showing off these new interfaces. A lot of it comes down to how do I accomplish this task? And I've been thinking about how do we bring that to What's going to be this, you know, back to this mid-funnel how-to content, right? How do I use Clearbit to score and route leads better using Lead Feeder? That's the type of thing that we need to organize our content in a way that an AI-assisted interaction can say, whoop, here you go. Yeah. And so it's going to be really interesting to see how and how quickly that type of interaction changes the way we think about, to your point, producing and organizing content so it can be used that way. This is actually a good segue into the second thing that you said, which was talking about personalization and using tools like Mutiny and things like that. How the heck are y'all doing personalization? How do you even think about this? Because I think that this is something that people are either like doing well, like doing not well, or just like, I am not even thinking about it yet. So I will say first, personalization is it's a long word and it's way too complicated. And I think if we rebrand <laughs> personalization, it would benefit it. Again, sounding like an old person, but I remember selling uh, personalization solutions in 97 and they were not much easier than they are now. So I think a better way to look at it, a way that we often look at it, is like segmenting and tailoring. And a little can go a long way in terms of what you show to a customer based on what you know about them. So a common example is when you're showing logos or use cases, or sorry, logos or case studies. And if a company comes to your website and you can tell it's a small company, oh, look, there's the company and they've got 14 employees and they're Series A funded and da 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 da, da. Assuming that's a, a good target for you, show them the logos and the case studies that are for small companies. 
And maybe even so far as small companies that are in their industry, if you have those. But that's going to be way, and the data shows, way more impactful than if you're showing a random assortment of logos and case studies, or worse, ones that are huge. Oh, wow. These folks work with IBM and Google. And they, okay, yeah, they don't work with companies like me. So even, quote, simple things like show the small companies, small company examples, and show the big companies, big company examples, end up going a long way. And then we regularly see people do simple but sophisticated things on like their pricing page where they will show more relevant plans or they will show good fit customers a different call to action. If you've got a company that you can tell because you reverse you DNI's IP, wow, this is like strike zone for my ICP. Let's offer them a free trial. I can't do it for everyone, but I certainly would do it for them. So you give them a free trial CTA versus schedule a demo or whatever the other CTA is. Huge impact. Just had a customer come and, and talk to our group about something they did recently. And they ran one of these changes on the homepage and it had a 972% increase in their click through. I mean, almost 10x, right? And so these things, these little things can have a huge impact, but they've got to be simple. Right. Back to the sort of small company, show them small company stuff. That's my soapbox rant on personalization is a little information can go a long way, but don't overcomplicate it. Pick two or three text areas, pick two or three calls to action and try to align them based on the, the things that matter most. That's so interesting. And I think that the corollary to that is make stuff on your website easy to find. Mm -hmm. buy the persona, buy the company size, buy all that stuff. Mm -hmm. But if Jeff Bezos taught us anything, if you can save him those clicks, you know what I mean? <laughs> then you're going to do a lot. Yep. It is interesting. And this is where you one wants to be careful because you don't want to appear creepy. Hey, how are things in Portland? Like, I, I don't need someone to like show off that they yeah. know where I'm coming from. But by the same token, I think as consumers, as B2C consumers, we sort of take for granted now that when I'm in, when I'm shopping at Best Buy or whatever, look, Best Buy, I shop there a lot. You shouldn't be treating me like we've never met before, right? I bought something last week. I'm a Best Buy rewards member. You know what my local store is. I just take all that for granted when I'm interacting with Best Buy online. And so figuring out what the B2B version of that is so that you can treat somebody like you know them because you can, but you also don't want to you don't want to be overbearing. I think that's where that personalization line falls in. And it's particularly important, I think, not just so much in the initial online interaction, but when you've got a company that's interested or in market or showing you those signals, when people use Clearbit to pass that over to sales, it's got all this rich information about it, right? It's not just an email address and maybe a title. It's a whole bunch of information that now they can use as they follow up and know how to prioritize that. Oh, I think that those things end up making a big difference in terms of priority. Oh, we didn't do most cuttable or stuff that you're maybe dialing back. Are you dialing back? We haven't really dialed back in terms of overall spend and, and budget. We've been fortunate that way. Our sector is pretty hot, but the Trying to think about things we've defocused on. We've defocused some on, on virtual events, honestly. That's not a shocker. The last couple of years, a lot of virtual events and virtual conferences. And it was, it felt like one of the only ways to sort of get out there or get access to pools of buyers. So we've shifted that to actual in person events and not a ton. We'll be going to, 10 or 15 in-person events this year and also looking to do some smaller events with our customers, like customer dinners and that sort of thing. So that's been a shift. I think we're, we are, and others, I think a little fatigue from all some purely virtual events. Yeah. That's probably the one that comes to mind most. Yeah. I do want to jump back to your first uncuttable of that mid-funnel content. That's a great uncuttable budget item recommendation. I'm curious how do you get ROI from that stuff? How do you show ROI from mid-funnel content? It's a good question. Attribution. It's so easy. We do though. We, we tagged all these things up and try to figure out what part, what content was two sides. What content attached most to our ICP and the personas? And a lot of that, a lot of that, especially our guides content in the mid-funnel, it's really jobs to be done oriented. Right. So it's almost just like mm -hmm. a, catalog, a catalog of jobs to be done. And we have hypotheses about 
these are the jobs to be done by these personas at these types of companies. And thanks to Clearbit and de-anonymization, we can actually see whether that's true or not. So we'll look at the Mm -hmm. guide for how to prioritize your leads based on fit and intent and say like, okay, did it actually connect with, does it appear to be useful to the personas and the companies we thought? So that's kind of the front end. And that's more a measure of, was our hypothesis right? And is our marketing dollar being well spent to get them there? On the back end, it's about, did they become opportunities and did those opportunities close? I find the first of those a little more useful. Like I think measuring whether or not in our language it became a sales accepted opportunity. That tells me if it's the right person, right company, right time. That's kind of what I can control. Whether or not they go on to buy, uh, lots of things that can factor in there. But we look at, did they go on to become an SAO or sales accepted opportunity as a key measure? So that's what we've kind of looked at. It's interesting because as you ask that, it's another reason or the challenge in doing that is another reason I'm excited about this like weekly demo idea because I want to create a sort of like a way post or a lily pad on that customer journey where I can see a bunch of them, you know, like, yeah, they won't all come, but like a lot will eventually. And then you can say, all right, well, what was that like? So much of the funnel management is complicated by so many different personas and so many different jobs to be done and then so many different products and paths. And then so, and like trying to create sort of a center of gravity around certain types of content or something like a weekly demo, I think it helps you to recognize the patterns more. That's so fun and such a great description. Do you see those people engaging with those type of mid funnel assets before they become an opportunity or even still a lot of them after they become an opportunity? We're seeing it. We're seeing it mostly before, but it it is a good question. I think some of the best mid funnel content reads almost more like documentation. I mean, if you kind of put it on two ends of the spectrum, one is the case study that is a thinly veiled ad for the product. And that's certainly a thing, but it's way over here. And then over here is like the API documentation, which is no bones about it, just the facts. And so something in the middle that's like, hey, here's actually how people like you are solving this problem. And it's got Visio diagrams and it's got suggested things and it might even have code snippets. I like that kind of mid-funnel content, which to your point could happen before they're ready to raise their hand and talk to someone, or it could come after because they're using it. It's educational enough. It's meaningful enough that it's actually a resource. So that's the balance we're trying to strike. I love it. It's fun. And this is a very clear bit pluggy sort of send off here, but I just feel like it's everything is so persona based, like the rise of Mm -hmm. account based marketing and like all this stuff. It just feels like all the momentum is going towards persona based stuff and us having the realization that these personas are so different and unique and how they buy, how the personas Mm -hmm. buy or how different people within one type of persona by and like it just feels like going that direction and pushing super i mean that's what personalization is that's what all this stuff is just going further and further and if you know who they are and you can create hyper niche hyper targeted like we are creating this case study for this one type of tiny use case for but we know that they, these three c- companies are the only ones who have it, and their lifetime value is a million plus and whatever. Then it's right. worth creating. That's the yeah. sort of stuff that like is endlessly fascinating to me. Yeah, and I think you're right. And I don't think that's gonna never say never, but that's an arrow that's gonna go in that direction for quite some time. So yeah, it'll be fun to watch. Kevin, awesome having you on the show. Thanks again for listeners. You can go check out Clearbit, and you can. Check out Kevin on the socials and on LinkedIn. Any final thoughts? Anything to plug? No, thank you so much for having me. It's super exciting year for MarTech and for Clearbit. And if you haven't had a chance to check out Clearbit, I do invite you to try out our weekly visitor report. It's a free tool that tells you the companies coming to your website and a little bit about how they fit your ICP. So check out the weekly visitor report. Awesome. Thanks again, Kevin. Thank you. That was super fun. 